Let's see. Hopefully not everyone went over to. <laughs> they'll everyone... all be on the other track. No, they'll all be on the other track. I know. If everyone went over to Jeff and Ed. Of course. They're the big fellas, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Uh... <laughs> they're the big fellas and they're the big personalities. So I'm not going to take any offense at all. No, that's totally fine. No, there are people trickling in, which is good. Uh, it's also, you know, a long day for people you know there's mm. a lot of sessions and I think if this was in person people would like you know take breaks here and there and whatnot but you know you want to also learn all of it and I think sometimes it's tough to uh, try to attend them all of course so but we will do with what we have we'll make it happen yeah um but yeah I I will wait or we'll wait a few more minutes or another 30 seconds and then we'll get started. <laughs> you know, we'll just go with the flow. That's the we name of the game. The flow. That's the name of the game. Should I share any fun facts about you while we wait? Yeah. Have you got any fun facts about me? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Fun <laughs> fact. Fun Favorite fact place to me. visit pre COVID. A pub <laughs> with a good fire and a pint of Guinness following a walk. Uh huh. I'm not a Guinness person, so you can take all the Guinnesses. Okay, fine. It's either that or it's a gin and tonic. Oh, there you go. Done yeah. deal. Done, Done deal. deal. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I think there was also another fun fact that you used to work in Thornton's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so for folk out there um, who don't know what Thornton's is, it's a chocolate shop. Um, and when I was a student, I used to um, ice messages onto Easter eggs and Valentine heart. And uh, guys who would come in, would um, they were too embarrassed to actually say what their messages were. You know, like, I love you, my fluffy bunny. So um, <laughs> they would write it. And they would pass it secretly across yeah, the Yeah, like the secret now where you're just yeah, like... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I would be going, I would be opening up the message and going, <laughs> and then I would be piping it onto chocolate. And, uh, you know, I never had any, you never had any grumpy customers. So that was fab. Uh, I bet, yeah, because you're getting chocolate. Like, uh-huh. And we were allowed to eat as much as we wanted to. So uh, I was quite plump. <laughs> that's, yeah, I was going to say that's tough. Mm-hmm. Well... We'll get started on that note. <laughs> we could do a whole session on chocolate, I'm sure. But uh-huh. um, so thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. I was Alex and I were uh, were talking before this just how she is going. Not that it's a competition or comparison, but, you know, the other session does have uh, Ed and Jeff Carroll from HD Buzz. So, you know, a lot of people know them and whatnot, but we're going to have fun here. And this is going to be a very informative session. So we're going to be doing a Q&A session on caregiving with Alex Fisher, an occupational therapist. Uh, most sessions today and later on have been about 30 minutes. This one's actually going to be an hour um, where you can actually ask any questions you have directly to Alex. And so all you have to do is you can put in the chat or you can put in the Q&A feature right below. And she'll answer uh as many questions as she can and we'll go from there and we'll have some fun so welcome alex we're thrilled to have you i'm going to pass it on over to you and perhaps you can kind of start with sharing a little bit about yourself okay hi everyone um my name is alex fisher and i'm an occupational therapist um in the uk and i work in the west midlands Uh, mainly in a city called Birmingham, which is right in the center of the UK. And myself and my colleagues uh, look after about 500 families with Huntington's disease. Um, So if any of you haven't heard of what an occupational therapist is, because I know we've got an international audience, um, essentially we are individuals, health professionals that try to solve practical problems for people uh, with Huntington's disease and their caregivers. Um, And so that can be anything. That can be about changing the environment. 
that can be about your level of activity, that can be about protecting you with your movement, that can be about rehab, maintenance, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's pretty much it. My job involves anything to do with your daily activity. So Matt has asked me to come on and talk to you about um, caregiving. So that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna kind of open up the floor. And uh, if you're all a little bit shy, we've got some guests coming in at around about 25 past seven, which is in about five minutes time. Um, just for a little bit of light relief. And also, even though Seth says it's not a competition, it sort of is, I wanted to steal people from uh, <laughs> Jeff next door. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, it's just about sharing some love for all of the caregivers out there because you are the glue that holds everything together. So, okay, let me... Uh, let me get my screen up because I did sort of do a bit of a presentation just in case people were shy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, um, okay. if you want to share, okay. um, feel free to, or, you know, a question. Here we go. See? Yeah, yeah, go share away. And then, okay. and then we'll hop into some questions. Okay. So it's a space for asking, for listening, for sharing stories, because we've learned so much today, haven't we, from sharing stories um practical stuff communication no question is a bad question and like i say we've got some special guests coming okay uh have we got any questions so far <laughs> probably not someone says they have a quick question but i'm waiting sure. for the question to come in um okay, okay in the meantime a question that i have regarding kind of the caregiving piece of it um is understanding like how, Ooh, how, how how do you make sure Alex like that the caregiver also like how do you remind them to take care of themselves you know and like I think that's such an important piece is we're always doing so much for everyone else mm -hmm. um, you know myself being a caregiver at one point for my mom and forgetting mm -hmm. oh I gotta take care of myself too so like maybe you can Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, of course. And actually, um, when I was coming up with some questions, just in case people were a bit shy, I went and I asked some people that I work with. And one of the questions was exactly that, um, that it's so easy to forget about yourself. And actually, earlier on, um, when there was a young lady talking in the session with Prof Rickards, a young lady called Anna, um, she said that you just forget yourself. So um, for me, when I'm working with caregivers, it is about being quite direct about the importance of looking after yourself, that it is okay to take time for yourself, that it's not okay to compare yourself to others. Because I think what happens is that you see this, um, out there there's a sort of a huge community of um, individuals that present the perfect caregiver. And actually it's no good looking at that because that's just not your life. Your life is individual, your life is full, it's busy. You're busy juggling plates. As you said, Seth, earlier on, you have an incredibly busy life. Um, and so it is about finding that small window and often or not, through um, connecting with organizations such as the HDYO and listening to people talk, uh, you realize how important it is. So the theme that's been going on right from the beginning of the day, I think it was Dr. Emma earlier on, she was talking about brain training. She said, it was quite incredible that by giving people permission through that research, that they actually took time for themselves so sometimes it's just about finding a way, but I will just uh, continue to remind people and have small conversations and let them have the space for that, really. Oh. Awesome. Um, someone did ask, how do you get in touch with OTs in the UK? And that, um, that their mom actually used to, used to be one and 
<laughs> that that uh, they feel like they're nowhere to be seen. Oh, okay, we're everywhere. <laughs> we probably just got a different title or something. Because um, mm -hmm. let's face it, occupational therapy or therapists, that's a big title right there. So it basically means therapists that actually, oh, hello. I think we've got our, oh, we've got our special guests, folks, coming on. <laughs> Um, do you want me to stop sharing do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see? yeah okay so let me just um how do i do that okay pause share stop share there we go okay have i stopped sharing yep okay so okay there's another alex fisher coming up on the screen but this is can everyone see this yeah okay <laughs> okay folks this is the new kids on the block these are the latest sensation from the UK and they are sharing a note of love. Yes, indeed, this is Goats with Notes and they have a note that says, HD caregivers rock. We're just gonna watch this for a moment. I think you'll agree, this is better than Jeff. Especially okay. when the, the goats are... The goats are actually eating the note right now. Eating the note. Which says, HD caregivers rock. <laughs> oh, this is great this is definitely better than whatever jeff and ed are showing <laughs> okay have you done the the uh what is it yoga with goats or something okay can i just say something that actually this farm in lancashire where these goats uh live um they are looking for a <laughs> yoga instructor <laughs> to do uh yeah yoga goat yoga with goats so <laughs> uh they're adorable i feel like i just want to take one home now uh -huh. well fear not they're coming back later on if we go a bit <laughs> quiet they're coming back later on <laughs> well you're getting a lot of people in the chat saying that they love it so okay fair enough <laughs> someone said someone said goat to go now okay <laughs> boom boom <laughs> i know i know um, and, it, and it's stuff it's stuff like that literally you were talking about um how do people look after themselves it mm -hmm. is moments like that just even if it's tiny moments of laughter or joy it's about finding that and again there was another young lady earlier on on the mental health panel arcana i think her name was and she was quite dedicated to that way of thinking um and I think that we all need to apply that. And it's sometimes so easy to forget and so easy to, um, you know, you feel like you often need complicated answers and actually you sometimes don't. So, okay. okay. Yeah, so real quick, going back to like where to find them in the UK or how to get in touch. Is it just, is there like, oh, yeah. I know you mentioned uh, they might be, the, Everywhere. the profession might well the profession might be called something different depending on where you live absolutely yeah so in the uk uh occupational therapists work in what's called local authorities so other people call them social services um so you can ring up your local council and you can ask for an occupational therapy assessment and those occupational therapists tend to be the experts with equipment and they also tend to be the experts with regards to adaptation of housing, which is really, really important in um, helping the individual with Huntington's disease um, maintain their function, but also minimize injury. Um, and of course, if you've got a house that you can't do anything in, then actually you're not gonna be able to do the things that you need to do or want to do. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important. The other place that you can find them is in community mental health teams, because occupation is really, really important in maintaining your uh, emotional well-being. Um, if you can't, again, do what you want to do, uh, your emotional well-being will suffer. And sometimes it's um, whilst psychological therapies are super important in HD and for HD caregivers, it's also activity is also really, really important. And the other place that you'll find them is in community rehabilitation teams or community, what they call neurological teams. 
Um, my job is in um, in a specialist Huntington's disease team, and some they they exist, but they're very few and far between. So seek them out, but start with your local authority. Start with your county council. Mm. I'm not obviously aware. Uh, in the US or in other countries, I think they might be a little bit more difficult to find. Most people know about physiotherapists or physioterrorists, as we call them. Um, but uh, sorry, I'm full of them tonight. Um, uh, but actually, usually working alongside a physiotherapist will probably be an occupational therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, a few people have mentioned they tried contacting them, but they didn't respond or been waiting for someone said waiting about 18 months and it kind of reminds me of just you know in the u.s with with finding a psychiatrist or a therapist it can take a long time too um mm -hmm. not sure 18 18 months a long time but i think that's also the other challenge i'm sure is like you know if there's like a wait list or like not um you know, not being able to access it when you need it most, you know? Definitely. I mean, I don't know um, the lady that said about 18 months. I don't know if she is based in the UK, but that seems an extraordinary long time. And I would say that nearly all occupational therapists throughout the world are all trained in very, um, oh, it is, yep, UK. Somebody's saying, yep, UK. That really does surprise me. Now, that might be to see a specialist occupational therapist but if you are struggling with your day-to-day -day function um, or whether you are struggling with your caregiving so for example you need some advice on manual handling for example really important because you've got to look after your physical well-being as a caregiver um, then you should be going to your local authority or via your local GP and making them aware that that's the case. Because that seems to me unacceptable. 18 months is totally unacceptable. Um, yeah. I'm sorry to be a bit political, but it is. Mm -hmm. And what would you say, I mean, due to the pandemic, you know, someone asked, you know, what would be the current kind of wait time for an OT, give or take? So like in, in my local area, what's happened, and again, it is about resource, unfortunately, is that a lot, a lot of my colleagues, um, therapists, physiotherapists and occupational therapists have what's called um, been redeployed. Um, and that means that they've been taken out of their community roles or other roles, and they've been placed on wards to care for people with COVID or to care for other people without COVID. And because the hospital's um, direction has been geared towards people with COVID, people are returning to their posts now um depending on what we face in the future um and the priority is being given to survivors of covid but you will have seen the um arguments in the press that actually that means that it leaves a lot of other people managing without and most of us as therapists are trying to mop that up um weights do depend weights do kind of go between about six weeks to 12 weeks maybe up to a maximum of three months okay cool all right got a few questions and hopefully they um make well they probably make sense but um if you're like a single parent family how can mm. you help them as i guess as a child or teenager uh, hi, Haley. Um, okay, so you're asking if you're in a single parent family, how can you help them as a child or a teenager? Okay, so if you are a mom or dad as a single parent with Huntington's disease, um, then absolutely you can be helped with regards to your caregiving um, by an occupational therapist, um, an adult occupational therapist, but there are occupational therapists that deal specifically with uh, people under the age of 18 and they're pediatric occupational therapists. And sometimes there are neurological pediatric uh, occupational therapists and they just basically, regardless of diagnosis, will look at what your needs are and work with you to try and find a solution. Awesome. Um, 
they are also based in schools. There are a lot of, um, in the UK now, there are a lot of OTs based in schools. I, sorry, I say OT, that's occupational therapist for short. Thank you. Um, have you noticed if family being the primary caregivers or professional care giving tends to be better for everyone's well-being? So I think it sounds like family versus, you know, if your family's a caregiver versus like that professional care. Is there one, one or the other that might be better for everyone's well-being, such as personal care? Um, okay, so it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, Huntington's disease, um, it is a huge society, but because um, what I've noticed over the years is that people are incredibly private um, and they don't want to open up to um, perhaps a professional's gaze because they're actually um, afraid of that gaze and what that might mean. But certainly as therapists, we're not out to get anyone, we're out to help people and help them manage their everyday occupation. Clearly, if there were issues around safety or safeguarding or worries about people, um, that would be a different thing altogether because we have a duty of care. But I would say that getting a professional involved and um, working alongside of them gives rise to a greater level of well-being and a lesser state of confusion. The thing is, we're in this kind of um, place, aren't we, in HD land where there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of anticipation um, about what's going on. Um, but ultimately, HD is a long-term condition regardless of whether we um, maybe have a cure or not and we've got to see it that way and so therefore it's a neurological condition let's work to see what uh, gains we can make what maintenance we can make dr emma spoke about um you know rehabilitation earlier on and brain training um occupational therapists and to a certain extent physiotherapists and psychologists can really really help with that and can help help maintain skills whilst these huge gains are being made in research. So I think it's really important to do that. Um, we know that the earlier you start, the, the longer that perhaps your skills can be maintained. So that's gotta be a positive thing for caregiver and for loved one. Another um, question. Oh, we do have another question that someone asked is uh, what home adaptations are yeah, adaptations. Have, have you found most, most help families to cope with caring for their loved one at home? And, um, and to adapt, I guess, at home. Yeah, okay. So it really does depend on the original structure of the house. Um, but for me, it's a been about entrance and exit. So entrance to the house, making sure that that's accessible, and then exit usually out into an open space, such as a garden or a yard, if you're lucky to have it. Um, okay, and then it's about being, um, in the UK, we have lots of teeny houses. Um, they're not usually on one level. Um, so it's being about resolving the stairs, which are a massive issue for folk with movement problems. Um, so sometimes it's about getting a lift installed. Um, then uh, the other thing is about making uh, personal care a lot easier. So um, uh, things like wet rooms are of huge benefit to everyone so that you can access the shower or the bath as you need to without fear of falling over. And of course, all of these things, if, if the house is adapted, that's less pressure on the caregiver. Um, of course, it means that your house might look a bit like a hospital and of course, people um, are very proud of their houses, aren't they? So we're all fairly sensitive, I think, as professionals to that. Um, but we're all fairly frank and fairly honest about the benefits of environmental adaptation. In the UK, there are grant systems that help. Um, and because I also work with the Huntington's Disease Association, we do a lot of advocacy for people to get the things that they need. Um, and again, through the HDYO, a lot of advocacy to get people what they need. It's really, really important. 
Yeah. And it's about having those open, honest conversations, right? Because mm -hmm. no, one, yeah. no one does well with change. And, you know, especially if it's like your home. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, you know, um, the HD community is such an amazingly open, rich, diverse community, but it's also quite closed off because it's been frightened by its past um, and what people what people think of folk with HD. And I think we kind of need to be a little bit more open and transparent. And there are people out there that want to help. Absolutely. Having some yeah. good questions. I like it. I like it. Look at that. Um, <laughs> Another one is just any any tips for supporting other caregivers. So, for example, if you have a your parent, it also helps take care of, uh, you know, the member of your family that has HD. Um, how do you you know, how do you support other caregivers? And I think that's it's, it's this is a good question, because same with me, where my dad was my mom's caregiver. And I felt like at times like he was I wouldn't say struggling, but like I felt like could I do something to help him? So I guess any, any tips in that capacity? Again, you know, I know that it's, um, it's not a, like a practical answer, but it is actually about um, holding a handout and saying, I think I know where you're coming from. Let's have a conversation about this. Um, how can I help is the first place to go. Um, and just very gently having the conversation. So in the UK, what tends to happen is people get referred really, really late um, to services. And at that time, it might be that crisis is occurring and you need to prevent risk and all of that kind of stuff. So actually, I would just say, please have the conversation and please reach out. Caregiver to caregiver, professional to caregiver, family member. And also the other thing here is that this... Um, Anonymous attendee says, um, finding their feet after a loved one has passed away. Um, you know, these organizations, we're here for you as well. Um, you're still part of this community and you've still got a lot of a lot to share. Um, and you've been part of this community for a very, very long time and we shouldn't be shutting the door on you. So that's where I'd go for it. I think it's just about conversations and trying to get in as early as possible. Because again, the sooner we know, the sooner we can do, the sooner it makes a huge difference on caregivers and their loved ones. Yeah, and I mean, kind of going off that, Alex, you know, with that um, question on like, for supporting someone that was a caregiver and I was trying to get their feet wet. Mm. You know, it's, my mom passed away about six years ago now and my dad, you know, he, he still goes to these support groups. I think he wants to still help others and that's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm also curious if this question is like, you know, how do you get them, support them to like continue to live life? You know what I mean? I don't know. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm just trying to look at it from all angles because that's, you yeah. know, something I'm always like telling my dad, like, hey, like, how can I support you and whatnot? So maybe that's um, another angle to look at too. Yeah, there is a, there is a, a sort of concept and it's called ambiguous grief, um, ambiguous loss. And it is literally about having somebody physically present, but psychologically absent. Um, and that same is true for um, folk who've experienced um, a loved one with HD passing away, um, but feel part of a community. The fact is that, is that there's no right answer. If your dad has, as long as your dad has one foot outside of the door and is looking outwards, he can still be gently looking inwards. Mm -hmm. no, that's great advice um someone in the chat asked are there any items that you routinely recommend families to buy for the person with moderately advanced hd or is it just different for each person or case uh no i think first and foremost it's about looking at the environment number one that's not going to cost anything so um in ot land we uh would look at the house as a house of hazards so you know your loved one with um, moderate stage illness. So you know that maybe they have got problems with their perception, they've got problems with their movement, they've got cognitive problems. And so navigating a house is, can be really, really tricky. So for example, tidy up the cables, take away the rugs, 
make sure that the lighting is good. I mean, I'm in a room right now and I, you know, I really wish I'd changed the light bulb because, and actually that could make me see better. So it's very, very simple things that are very, very low cost. Um, the other thing is that I would say is that if you are gonna spend um, money, think about things like sensor devices so that as a caregiver, you can be, um, you can be out of the room. You can be out having your five minutes in the kitchen and you know that your loved one is in the lounge and you know that if there's any difficulties, the sensor alarm, which might be plugged into the wall, um, will go off and then you can actually come and attend to the individual. So um, my mum is, uh, she's got a movement disorder and uh, recently she broke her hip. So she's living downstairs and my dad's living upstairs and we plugged in my Alexa. And so my mum calls the Alexa and it gets my dad up if he needs her. Um, so there are really low cost items and tricks that people can do by themselves without professional involved that make a massive difference. Awesome. We're halfway through. Look at that, I think, yes. Okay, cool. Um, another question <laughs> regarding uh, in, in the UK, where do you access financial support for house adaptations for okay, home so caregiving? This, okay, so um, this goes back to earlier on, I said about um, approaching your local authority. So um, also known as a county council, also known as social services. So you ring them up and you can self-refer in the UK, you can self-refer um, and you can ask for an occupational therapy assessment. And the occupational therapist will come out and they will talk with you about what the difficulties are for either you or your loved one. And if it's fairly obvious that actually it's housing that's causing an issue, they then might say, well, okay, what we actually need to do is we actually need to help you apply for housing, um, or maybe we need to adapt what's um, going on in your own house. And depending on what the answer is, because housing often sits separately in the UK from occupational therapy, it's then at that point that you can say, well, actually, what about what's called the Disabled Facilities Grant? Um, and then you can then go, go through that process, um, which is the bit where you get um, sort of uh, lifts put in or you get um, bathroom adaptation so what I call the bricks and mortar stuff awesome awesome okay um so how are we doing we're we're good um yeah okay yeah we yeah. we've got we've got I feel like gotten a lot of great questions and I don't know I'm trying to think if there's Okay, oh, okay, so I'm just having a look here as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, we did say that it would go a little bit quiet, didn't we? So we did. We did. I mean, there's only so many questions you can ask, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. um, I guess, you know, caregiving, right, is a big thing. And I'm curious, is because I've, I've seen it in families, um, is, you know, once that person passes as a caregiver, how do you, how do you move on with life? Right? Like, and I mean, like romantically as well. Mm -hmm. um, and at what point is it okay to kind of move on? Uh, gosh, do you know what? Okay, I know, so I know, nice. I know your, your, your uh, role is not dating therapist, but I figured out. I get that. involved. I, do you know what? I get involved in uh, romance. I get involved with young people that actually just want to have a relationship, uh, who want to have their first sexual experience, um, because most people will see it as a natural part of their daily activity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we forget about sleep and we forget about sex. So actually, I think it's a really important part of my role. Um, lots of people might not think that. Um, but as part of my assessment, I will ask about their relationships. I will ask about their sexuality because it's really important. Mm -hmm. um, so, but with regards to um, a caregiver, losing somebody that they love, um, that's a really hard one because I think if you just take to HD out of the question, you've just, loved, you've just lost somebody that you love um, immensely, then actually 
I think you're just gonna, you're going to grieve and you may actually hold on to them forever or you may not and you may move on. I mean, the heart's a funny thing, isn't it? So, um, but I think you give yourself time. I certainly, I've certainly seen and I've talked with people who have been sisters looking after brothers with Huntington's disease. And, you know, they've given up perhaps their whole lives to looking after those individuals. And suddenly there's this whole world that opens up and it's a strange world. And it's perhaps a less forgiving world than HD land. So, and that sounds really hard. That sounds really bonkers that I'm actually saying that, but I've seen people really, really struggle with that. And actually like your dad kind of re almost reaching back in because that's what they know. And it's like any structure when you move out of it, it's, it's quite foreboding. So I would say be gentle and reach back into psychology if you need it, reach back into the people that you know if you need it and reach out and being reaching out is brave too. Uh, Arcana earlier on when she was talking about her mental health was just talking about trying something new is really, really hard. Really, really hard. Um, yeah. It definitely is. Um, it's just, you know, you kind of have to try to adjust to this new normal. Um, mm -hmm. you're used mm -hmm. to caring for someone um, and I mean the other part also maybe you can talk uh, touch base upon is when you first kind of transition into that role as a caregiver right like it's it's your loved one it's your you know whether it's your significant other or your child or your parent or someone else in your family but like you know, that transition into a, being now a caregiver, I feel like is, is, is different and it's tough to adjust to. So maybe. Mm, you're taking on a, a completely different role, aren't you? You say, for example, you're, um, I don't know, you marry somebody, then you find out that they've got HD. Um, it's not necessarily, and depending on what has said and what has been said, you're not necessarily expecting to, take on that role you were going to be husband and wife you weren't going to be husband and caregiver mm -hmm. um and for some people it happens overnight and some people can see their future coming so it really does depend on their experiences and i've seen all of those different experiences and i know that suddenly suddenly you are having to transition and the only way that you can do that often is actually and this goes part of this is this huge thing today is about connecting with people. Are you finding this really hard? I'm finding this really hard. Um, actually, you know, I feel a great pressure or I feel a great guilt to do this. I don't want to do this. Is this okay? Um, I was going to show a little video today um, and it was um, from the movie Bad Moms. Um, I think I've well, <laughs> seen that movie. Um, yeah, well, it's about, I think, this sort of like um, being a perfect mum that's out there. You know, I think you guys in the US, you have what's called the PTA. Um, is it like Parent Teachers Association? It's something at school. Oh, yeah. And there's yeah. this like competition. It seems like there's this competition between all of the mums to be like the perfect mum. No, and actually, no. it's like um, caregivers need to learn to be that, you know, that's you don't need to be that. You can actually uh, go to the PTA and you can buy, you know, buy cakes. You don't have to make them and they can have um, appallingly bad ingredients in them. And that's kind of OK. Everything is OK. Everything is up for a bit of trial and error. As long as you've got somebody that you can usually say to, is this all right? Am I OK doing this? And just checking in. And that's that's about things today, isn't it? Today is about a huge connection. There's so much individualism out there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, and the HD world, it's it's a kooky world, but it's actually a world where you can make connection and you can find people that are feeling exactly the same way as you are. Caregivers too. It's really important. So yeah. Important. And I mean, just to piggyback off that, you know, someone that did ask like. And I think, I mean, I think you answered it kind of on the steps for preparing to be a caregiver, but 
any kind of techniques to prepare both mentally and physically for that step? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually asked, I asked a lady who, um, and she has a son, an 18 year old son, and I asked her specifically this, and um, I'll see if I can get up on my messenger um, just to see. I said, what, what tips would you give to caregivers? Oh, here we go. Oh, oh, we've got the new kids on the block coming back. Okay, I'll talk about that in a moment. See if I can, up? Maybe I should spotlight this for everyone. Oh yeah, here we go. There we go. You can pin it. Oh, can you? Oh, wow. Okay. Right, so this way. is the next message to uh, HD caregivers out there. This is the next goat with a note moment. Yeah, here we go. Ten to you, say no, say yes, be bold, talk, share. You are loved. Okay. And then the goats are like, hey, I'm just going to eat this. Yeah, absolutely. And can I just say, these are edible notes. And oh, no goat, okay. No, no <laughs> goats were harmed in the filming um, of, this, of this video. And uh, this farm, by the way, uh, they've gone, uh, they've earned about 50,000 pounds over lockdown. Um, and it's going towards a new goat shed, a very environmental goat shed. Love so it. they're super proud to be associated with the HDYO. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Sean. <laughs> Look at that. They look so friendly. Remember, you can apply for the uh, yoga instructor's job. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Maybe, maybe, had, maybe, maybe you should have had in in between the breaks. We should have had yoga with goats, shouldn't we? I know. Maybe maybe I should. Mr. Trick. I should move to the UK just to get this instructor job. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, they look friendly. Yeah. <laughs> if I was flexible and closer, I would so want to apply for that, says one of the attendees. That's brilliant. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Got to go now. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh dear okay right so transitioning to caregiving yeah <laughs> <laughs> where were we at were we talking about caregiving yes we were okay uh yeah so, you're gonna i think share from... yeah i'm gonna share something from uh, a lady called helen who uh she won't mind me telling saying her name and her son's called caleb so if they're listening hello um she said what we found helped um Continue as normal as possible, um, making your loved one not feel self-conscious or a burden. Um, do more activities together. Go out, concerts, swimming, or just for a drive. Apathy is a symptom of HD, and he's going to say no, um, but try and make it about you needing to go out um, as it helped us get him out, and he really, really enjoyed it. And therefore, you're practicing and you're maintaining skills. Um, Encourage as much as possible for him to do things himself. Um, get an OT involved. Make sure the environment is set up. Um, don't push it too hard. Um, and don't push it too hard on yourself. Pamper yourself. As time progresses, these things become more difficult. So just keep showing love and commitment. And that was to her marriage as well. She wanted that mm -hmm. to be said. Respite is really, really important to give yourself and to make some time for yourself and to spend quality time with good friends. This lady does know how to spend quality time with friends. Her Facebook is full of stuff about spending quality time with friends. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help if needed. And then Caleb said, as a son, so he's also a caregiver as well, because mm -hmm. I think we kind of go, okay, it's a son, no, not caregiver, totally a caregiver. Might not see yourself in that role, but you absolutely are. You also in the UK, by the way, need to get that recognized officially and you can apply for a carer's assessment. So I don't know if that's available to other people around the world. Support mum uh, with chores as much as possible, bless him. Um, 
an important aspect of keeping dad's brain was active. It's like a muscle, so it needs exercise. So that's what Dr. Emma was saying this morning. Mm -hmm. So I did things like brain training on the DS, jigsaws, board games, um, watching TV together, but trying not to make it long term because otherwise he would sit on the sofa all day. <laughs> um, and then go for walks with an end goal. So he would say, dad, let's go for a chippy, chippy tea. Oh, sorry, a chippy tea. That's fish and chips, by the way. Okay. A chippy dinner. I've fish had fish and chips in the UK, by the way. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I a short walk ending in a coffee shop or an ice cream shop or a chippy tea. Um, most importantly, I make time for myself to relax. So this is Caleb and he's 18. Uh, don't be afraid to speak to anyone else or if you have any questions or worries. I hope this helps you. So, Love from Caleb, Helen and Caleb. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, someone also asked, is there a list of resources people can buy themselves for quite cheap, like simple aids? So I'm thinking on the, um, I know that I'm advertising other people, but the Huntington's Disease Association in the UK has um, very simple lists of things that you can actually um, buy on their website. I'm sure they have. And if they haven't, I'm going to put it on there for you because um, I've got it up here. But of course, you need to actually see it at a time that it's available to you. Again, I guess I would go back to my look at your house as a hazard and make simple changes such as um, tidying away those hazards. Um, sometimes things such as there's a, a shop called Ikea over here, which is we got it too. Sweden as well. You got it we as well. Okay. It. So they have wonderful little cheap um, devices that can go on the edge of tables that could just stop people knocking their skin. Just things that make a massive difference. They sell sort of really cool mats that stop things kind of flying off the table when you're having a dystonic jerk. So there's so, so many things, sports bottles. So you don't really need sort of to spend loads and loads of money on specialist uh, kit, um, such as, you know, sort of drinks cups, um, pipe lagging on knives and forks. So the things that you use to wrap around pipes to keep them hot, mm -hmm. uh, can go on sort of the ends of knives and forks and make them much easier to hold and are really, really cheap. So yeah, loads of stuff. Awesome. <laughs> we only have, I think we have like about 15 minutes left. Okay. Um, well, what should we talk about? <laughs> I was going to say, any other questions from anyone, uh, feel free to ask them in the Q&A feature or in the chat. I feel like we've had a lot of great questions on just caregiving and different aspects of it, which is important. Yeah, I guess, you know, whilst we're whilst we're waiting, um, I think it's important to say that there is never one right answer. So don't beat yourself up too much. It's a bit trial and error. Um, and the other thing here is that um, is that often by adjusting the activity, often by adjusting the environment, often by adjusting communication and the sensations that are coming into and out of the body for the person with HD, it can make a huge difference with regards to um, caregiving in that it reduces behaviors, reduces agitation, can lift mood, so, so many things. Diet is really important. Make sure that you know, you're getting um, a good diet, but if you're losing weight, that can affect your ability to engage in activity. So make sure that you're getting to see a dietitian if possible, speech and language therapist for communication. Mm -hmm. um, so many things that you can also embed into kind of uh, your day-to-day -day practice that will make a difference. So um, Helen basically said to me, she's a bit of a movie buff. So she says to me, not just about bad moms as well. She also said to me, you know, the movie Groundhog Day? Yeah. She says, sometimes it's a bit like Groundhog Day. Um, you're like, uh, you, you're the Bill Murray character and you wake up and um, you're listening to Sonny and Cher on the clock and you just think, oh my goodness, not again. But actually she said, what you do is you get a chance to practice and get it perfect. And then actually 
by that you can make your life a lot easier and you can make your loved one's life a lot easier. And then you can introduce sort of um, space for yourself, which is what we said was really, really important. Um, and you can maintain the skills of your loved one. Awesome. Someone did ask, is there a book, a book like Acceptance for Caregivers or other great, hmm. uh, you know, read or like books for, for mindset? Uh, yeah, this, um, so there are two main books. Um, the first one is actually by a guy called Hugh Marriott, and it's called, it's an awful title, but it works, The Selfish Pig's uh, um, Guide to Caregiving. So if you think about it in terms of um, sometimes when you take time for yourself, you feel really guilty because you feel like you're a selfish pig. And so that's actually the title of it. Um, and actually it's pretty good because it's basically saying take time for yourself and don't feel guilty. And the other one, which is HD's, well, Hugh was a, um, he was a caregiver for, for his wife with HD. Um, and then the other one is Jimmy Pollard's um, Caregivers, uh, A Cognitive Companion, yes. which is about embedding what we know about HD into everyday caregiving. Um, and if you like, Jimmy, Jimmy says actually practicing, practicing, practicing till it's perfect, um, which is kind of like what Helen said. It's a bit Groundhog Day, but it works. Awesome. Mm -hmm. oh thank you <laughs> thank you very much i got them in turkey about 12 years ago i think it was <laughs> that's awesome we do have another question mm -hmm. how do you recommend keeping individuals with hd active and social when they have severe social anxiety and irritability in public settings ah okay so this is a really complicated question because you've just said about anxiety and social and public settings. Um, so I think we're pretty much all aware that anxiety is a massive problem for people with HD right from the get go, but usually going to more towards the middle stages. And often it results from um, it's an innate anxiety, but also it can be an anxiety related to an individual being aware of how they look, how they're moving, how they're perceived by others. But the other thing to say here is that um, in an environment which is uh, overwhelming, i.e. such as a public space, um, with regards to noise, screams, tires, cars, um, we do now know that the individual with Huntington's disease is exceptionally sensitive to sensory input. So actually what you've got is those two things colliding. So um, it's about working out what's going on. So actually, if it's innate anxiety um, and it is about, um, then it, it is about seeking the support of your doctor with regards to that. Um, if it's about awareness and how the person is being perceived um, and they are able to engage with psychology, I would suggest that they do that. And now they can do that in the UK. It's pretty difficult, but we do have that we can work with CBT therapists. Uh, that's cognitive behavioral therapists, by the way, or psychologists. Sometimes the therapy needs to be adjusted for the individual with Huntington's disease, so delivered in a different way because of cognition, but it's perfectly possible. Um, so that pronged approach, but then also being aware that actually maybe just maybe you need to go back to grading that individual's exposure to that space or actually even rethinking about where they're going. It might be important to you as a caregiver to go to, the, to that space, but actually if it's too much for your loved one and then it's gonna cause distress, maybe it needs rethinking bearing in mind what we've spoken about with the sensory overload. Oh, crikey. I think I seem to have lost no, you. No, uh, yeah, it's the whole put myself on mute. Uh, I was, <laughs> as we wrap up, uh, any other final thoughts or takeaways, Alex, that you wanna share with everyone here? 
Uh, yeah, uh, get started early. Earlier, earlier on, we had Dr. Emma, who was one of the first uh, talks here today. And she was talking just about the benefits of activity and being involved in activity, both for people with HD and for their loved ones and their caregivers. Start early, make plans. It will enable you to feel a lot more in control and it will give you the time that you need to look after yourself um, and look after your loved one. Connect with people, share, listen to stories. Doesn't have to be technical, doesn't have to be expensive. So much today that, oh my goodness, I've learned. Wow, just keep doing that keep doing that and if if needs be find me send me a message on this amazing chat thing and i'll reply to you as well awesome thank you again alex this is this was great uh and thank you to the audience for asking some really good questions i, I thought it was very helpful very insightful and um you know i know it's a few more minutes but i'll we'll give people uh you know a few minutes just quick break it's a lot right for an hour just to kind of digest everything and process it all but you know the next kind of two sessions we have coming up one on is track one with mariana who's going to be sharing her experience of having a child with uh through pre-implementation genetic diagnosis also known as pgd and then track two is hdo's former uh, board chair BJ sharing his HD journey. Two really good talks. Two people I, I've had the chance to meet and, and know and uh, and are friends with. So either one is going to be great. And if you can't make both like me, just know that we are recording them. So the goal is to put them out so that people can see them if they missed it or want to go back to one later on. So with that being said, no need to thank me. I just asked the questions, everyone. It was all Alex, so no worries. But you all are rock stars, and um, I hope everyone has a good rest of their conference. And see you, see you around virtually or physically one day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Take care, everyone. Bye.